As Mark walked on campus, he noticed a man with dishevelled hair standing there. It was Professor Mitchelson. Standing on the pebble walkway with crossed arms, his deep purple eyes were from lack of sleep. When the professor saw Mark, his eyes widened to a wild stare. Uh Uh-oh. Looks like you're in trouble. I guess we'll see you around. Clamping his sweaty palms into a fist, Mark kept his head low as he walked over the gravel. He stopped in front of Mickelson, but didn't look at his face, afraid to see what was there. Instead, Mark felt waves of righteous anger through their progenitor Tyro Link. The rolling tempest was kept back by whatever little patience lingered within the older vampire. Stepping with strong strides, the professor looked as though he could push his apprentice off a building. He talked with chipped syllables as he led Mark towards the centre of the campus. Exhaling, he spoke in a gruff voice. How could you? How could you be so stupid? I thought I chose a smart Tyro, not a fool. The anger behind his words pressed down around them. I left you a message on your phone. Shit. His excuse sounded lame even to him. And then you never answered your phone. That's really being a genius. Grabbing Mark's shoulders, he squeezed until they hurt. You never checked in with me. Not even once to say you were okay. You're a brand new vampire. It's not safe for anyone to be traveling with you, especially humans. Your RA opened your room for me when I couldn't contact you. What did he find? Your cell phone. I thought that you'd regretted your choice and went wandering God knows where. I was okay. I was with the twins and... He sniffed Mark's shoulder and sneered. Vampires. What's this? Human blood. Please tell me you didn't hunt with other vampires. He stilled and concern fled from their link. Something cold and calculating replaced it. Hunt? You mean chase down humans? The professor reached into his tweed jacket pocket and held something against his chest. A wooden stake peeked from the material flap of his jacket. His cold eyes studied Mark as he spoke in a hollow tone. Whose blood do I smell? It might be from Kyle or Nate. Damien drank from them hard. Belmonte told me where he found you at that damn house of skulls. Don't ever do that again. Do you understand? I mean, they're a little different, but I don't think... No, you didn't think. He returned the wooden object back into his jacket. Speaking to himself, he said, He's only a week old, and my Tyro met the House of Skulls. Why them? Why not meet the Grim Reaper? Do you know what those vampires could have done to you? They could have drained you dry, killed you for fun. Just like you drank from another vampire? Were you just thinking of killing me now? That's totally different. Sometimes, as Enforcer, there are things I hate to do each and every damn time. You didn't answer my question. What about your progenitor? Something flashed across Mickelson's face before he stilled his expression. As far as my progenitor goes, that's another story. I did drink from my creator. I did what my father asked me to do. I obeyed him like you're supposed to obey me. If I ever hear that you joined the Skulls on a hunt, yes, I will kill you without a second thought. Are you surprised? The Skulls are known to break the code and hunt humans. Have you forgotten? I ended the one who tried to murder you. He was Damien's friend. Damien's a devious leader and will try to use you to get revenge on me. Never forget it. Sharp fangs protruded from Professor Mickelson's sneer. Mickelson was dangerous. Mark understood why he was chosen to be the enforcer. But who was telling the truth? Was Damien right or was his mentor? It was a mistake to let you out of my sight before you were at least a year old. Starting from today, you'll be barred from the society. No! 
Life alone as a vampire would be torture. Some people manage better by themselves, but Mark never figured himself as that type of person. Loneliness. How long could someone last by themselves without anyone who'd understand? The professor pulled open the door to the teaching theatre. You'll be banned from the society meetings until they meet again at Mrs. Violet's house. That'll be four months. Until then, you'll train each weekend with me. You're not to leave the city. He gave Mark a cruel smile as Mark sulked. What's the problem? You're a vampire. Four months should be nothing to you. You've got eternity. Just focus on graduating. Relief flooded Mark. He wouldn't be isolated forever. Four months should be easy. Jodie stopped by Mark's dorm room. She animatedly talked about her spring break. When she asked about Mark's, he said that it was boring and that there was nothing to really say. He wrapped his arm around Jodie, guiding her to a corner of the room. He leaned against his desk as he touched his mouth to hers, feeling her hot lips. Softly, he kissed down her cheek and to her throat. He felt her pulse beneath his lips. Nibbling at her neck, he breathed in her scent. It had been a while since he fed, and Mark was becoming dizzy. It's Jodie, I, I can't bite Jodie. Giving her a deep kiss, he held Jodie close. No, Mark! I'm mad at you. Stop that! Why? What's wrong? You've been ignoring me. My phone calls... Everything about our relationship is wrong. It's like after our first date, you've completely changed. I'm worried about your health. You've become so pale. I've been so worried about you, but you haven't cared about me. The only time you do is when I make the effort to see you. Is there something you want to tell me? Mark looked away. I see. I believe that two people in a relationship should be honest with each other. Are you seeing someone else? He shook his head. Then what is it? You and I can never be together. We can never last. Our places are too different. You have a whole future out there. You and I both knew we could only be a short-term thing. You're gonna graduate, I'm gonna graduate. We'll both be going our own ways pretty soon. He'd watched her for weeks in Mickelson's class before finally having the courage to ask her out. He was glad he did. She was someone he wanted to spend time with. She was fun. He knew eventually he'd stop dating her. He just didn't want that to happen so soon. She was the sunshine he could never reach. He had to protect her light. She didn't deserve the darkness he lived in. Why didn't you tell me sooner you were thinking about this? I know. I get it. But can't we just stay with each other a little longer? Just until graduation? I see. No, I understand. I'm sorry, Mark. Goodbye. A knock came at Mark's door as the twins peeked their heads inside the, his room. They were paler than usual and they had many sets of double bruises on their necks and arms. Standing up, Mark asked them what the hell happened. Damien was a little angry today. He takes it out when he drinks. Yeah, on us. Why was he so upset? You. He ran into Professor Mickelson. Your professor told Damien off and that we're supposed to leave you alone? As if we'd listen to him. You need to break his rules. The Skulls will hang out with whoever they want. Why don't you come and join them? And we could always stay friends. Do you think the Society of the Arts will let you keep hanging with us? I mean, they could just stop hanging out with Damien. Why don't you just stop hanging out with Damien? We're loyal donors. Someday they promise to make us into one of them. We're going to be vampires too. You really think he'll make you into a vampire? Why wouldn't he? You're donor, that's why. 
I don't think that they can keep biting random club girls. Somebody will find out. You are his steady blood supply. But for how long? How long do you think you can handle being bit, being food? What will they do the day you say no? So now you're a vampire, you think you're better than us. That you know more than us. Just don't. Some of us aren't as lucky as you. For a split second, something like envy crossed their faces. Lucky? I'm this way because I was attacked. I didn't have much time to make my choice. I wish I wasn't a vampire. Life as a vampire isn't perfect. There's sacrifices. Like what? Jody and I broke up. Boo-hoo. I thought you were going to say something big. I thought you were into her. Did Professor Mickelson make you two break up? Like, he's separating you from your friends? Mark didn't like how they asked that. Like, somehow, he was the professor's dog. I can't be with her unless she's a donor. The code says that only human donors may know what we are. And before you even suggest it, I won't bring her into this world. You may not understand it, but it's for the best. No, I think I get it. You like her a lot. Mark exhaled and calmed himself. This path, this life, in the end, I chose this. Officially, I'll be introduced to all the vampires in Colorado this week. I'm sticking with this society. I don't really trust Damien yet. I don't really trust the society, but yeah. Whatever. The next morning, Mark thought to wait for the twins to walk to class together, but he changed his mind. Pissed off with them, he left the dorm early. Sunshine burst between the leaves of giant oak trees, casting broken shadows over the sidewalk. Where there was no shade... Mark felt the strong sun drain him. Charlie was right. Even after getting used to his vampire life, the sun was exhausting. Eventually, he hid beneath the shade of the history building. One of his professors spotted him. It was Brother Luke, his, pre his French professor. He calmly walked to him wearing the robes of his order. Hi, brother. Bonjour. How are you? An uncomfortable pressure grew the, the closer the brother walked towards Mark. Mark couldn't look directly at him. At first, he wondered why, then he saw the giant cross around the brother's neck. Sweat broke on Mark's brow. His breaths became faster. He had to act normal. Um, I'm graduating soon. I can't wait to walk across the stage, get my diploma, and, uh, get out of here. Congratulations, then. You're an outstanding student. I know your future will be bright. Mark liked Brother Luke. As a professor, he was funny and demanding as he taught French. As a religious clergyman, he debated with Mark, trying to convince Mark of the importance of the soul and its relationship with God. He extended his robed arm and gasped as Mark reluctantly shook his hand. Mark knew what the brother felt. Mark's body temperature was cold and dry to the touch. Looking at Mark as though he could see through him, Brother Luke's face settled into a scowl. A hollow feeling sat in Mark's gut and he felt like he would pass out. The presence of the man was too strong. It felt good, perhaps even holy. It was as though it came from his spirit. But how could that be? Mark barely considered himself an agnostic. Yet, he felt something more than what the five senses could tell him. The brother whispered his next words. Mark, what have you done? I'm not going to bite him. Mark wasn't a Catholic and was indifferent to Christianity. However, at that moment, he knew the brother sensed something more from him. Maybe there was something significant in his religious training. It was if he knew his secret. Brother Luke's hands flashed and gasped his cross against his chest. What do you mean? I'm still me. Let's leave it at that. Mark stepped around the man and Brother Luke called out. Remember that God is always there for you. Trust in him. Your soul is worth so much more. Don't worry. 
I've nothing but a long life ahead. Mark scoffed. Later, he realised the truth behind those words, and he wondered what kind of life he'd live. Outside, the stone mansion had lines of neat pine trees and rock pillar fences. There were cattle and goats, a few flowering trees, neatly pruned bushes, and a few humans tending the property. There were other buildings, probably guest houses, nearby the main mansion. The mansion itself was enormous. The wide structure was big enough to hold three wings. Its white exterior was capped with a terracotta roof and anchored by large heavy dark bronze doors that were moulded with angels blowing trumpets. The detailed work was nothing that Mark had ever seen before. They had a master's touch. The third story had no balcony. When the Society of the Arts walked to the entryway, a butler opened the main doors, greeted them, taking their coats. Wiping his shoes off at the doormat, Mark walked inside the impeccable marble entryway. Mark gasped. Luxury filled the stone mansion. His eyes were drawn upwards. The dome entryway had a mural of the sun and clouds were painted above. At their feet, set in polished marble, rested the Society of Arts Theatre Mask seal. Mark carefully read the words. Act your part well. There, our secret lies. This phrase was very true for the society. They were always playing a role. Mickelson as a professor. Mrs. Violet as an art curator. Charlie as a chill musician. The act of Belmonte leaving his self-isolation to go into the city was in some ways like an eccentric prince returning from mingling with the commoners. But then again, although Belmonte was a president, he never acted like he was above anyone else. If anything, Mark noticed that he saw himself as a true artist, and his expeditions into the city were what gave his work life. He'd seen his colourful paintings of Denver and how he saw other cities in the world. Belmonte would break away from his inspiration to return to the centre himself there, in this luxuri luxurious paradise. Staying away from his artistic subjects was what made his works unique. He captured their flavour and emotion. Belmonte was truly an introvert by nature. From where they stood, Mark noticed that there was an atrium in part of the building. The butler motioned them to follow. He led them past a large dining room with a table that could seat 30 or more guests. Red upholstered high back seats lined the dark wood table. An old red and white vase sat on a small table in the corner of the room. A large classic style painting hung on the right wall of the room and the windows on the left side of the room remained with their curtains opened. Mark could only take a glimpse of the painting. It was of a man dressed in scarlet, renaissance-style clothes with a large white feathered black floppy hat. He sat upright while his two white dogs sat beneath him. One of the dogs rested on his haunches while the other lay beside his master's feet. Mark recognised the man. It was President Belmonte. Sitting on a footed couch was the President himself. He sat with his knees spread apart, an elbow resting on one of his knees. Mark was beginning to get used to being a vampire. He could tell the difference between the president's slower heart rate and that of a human's. Leaning over, Belmonte touched his fist beneath his chin and Mark noticed that he also wore the society's ring on his pinky. Two more vampires, a couple, joined his side. This is Anne and Andrew Brickford. This is Mark. He is Mickelson's Tyro. The couple nodded to Mark. Looks like everyone's here. Let's begin. Stepping forward, Charlie bowed, took the president's hand and kissed his ring. President Belmonte.
Anne and Andrew Brickford did the same. When Mrs. Violet approached, she kissed Belmonte's ring. However, unlike the others, he in turn gave a slow kiss to the back of her hand. In return, Mark raised an eyebrow. There had to be something there between them. Mark felt uncomfortable about the whole ring kissing thing. He thought this was something from the Dark Ages, or maybe even the Mafia. At first, he balked at it. He was an American, born in Colorado. He wouldn't kiss someone's ring. From what he knew of Charlie's heritage and even Mrs. Violet's pride, he couldn't believe that they would bow to another. Besides, they were in the USA. Americans would never bow to a king, yet alone kiss a ring as a sign of fidelity. Freedom is sacred to them, and they saw all individuals as equal in respect, from janitor to president. The thought burned him, but Mark didn't want to insult the society. Hesitantly, he took a step forwards. Professor Mickelson, who's watched his internal struggle, grabbed his wrist. The professor shook his head. Instead, he bowed and Mark followed his action. No need to do that. We aren't part of his direct family. What he means is that Steve isn't my title. Whenever my family gathers, this is a tradition we do. These are my closest allies. We have others in the society, and they live all over the country, but these are the ones I trust my life and my blood with. You'll meet vampires from all over Colorado this week. A few from the society, some from other groups. Wait. I'm confused. Professor, aren't we related to the Society of the Arts? No, not by blood. My progenitor was a knight once. Until recently, he was the oldest vampire in the United States. It was he who insisted that the enforcer position be reinstated in the New World. But you've never asked me to kiss your ring before. Why? Do you want to kiss it? <laughs> no! Of course not. It'd be weird. Yes, it'd be awkward for me, too. Every vampire community has their own traditions. My progenitor always asked me to kneel whenever I greeted him. Don't worry. I won't ask the same. You were my partner as a teaching assistant. You'll be my partner again, this time as a trainee enforcer. If you'd like. As Mark remembered, his progenitor was the one that rumours that Professor Mickelson killed. The Enforcer is the only position among vampires that is superior to a vampire organization's leader. The only thing that may overrule an Enforcer is the majority of the conclave of house leaders. And majority decisions almost never happen with them. Mickelson and his progenitor stayed near us mostly so they wouldn't be alone. Even Enforcers know their safety in numbers. How many enforcers are there? Worldwide. Not enough. Maybe one per twelve vampire houses. You can never increase the number of enforcers and are only allowed one apprentice. If both his apprentice and an enforcer dies, and the conclave of house leaders selects a new enforcer. There were no enforcers in North America when I arrived with my progenitor. Let's say it took some convincing that we were needed. Only two more have been appointed since us. Okay, so I don't trust Damon. Uh, I don't trust Damien. But I'm not sure I want to be an enforcer. I kind of just want to chill and be a vampire normally, but I don't trust the skulls. Like, one of them literally tried to kill me. I don't trust them as far as I can throw them. Um, so I think in this circumstance, I'm just going to say nothing. A grand portrait of Mrs. Violet hung on the far wall. He studied the painting. It was so lifelike. 
He could see every brush stroke of her textured velvet clothes. Wisps of hair escaped her updo, freely edging her face. Whoever painted this painting was not only a master of art, but also cared a great deal for his subject. It has a remarkable resemblance, doesn't it? It's exactly like you. It's amazing. For a moment, I thought it was a photograph. Belmonte will be pleased to hear that. The president painted it? He traded his older paintings with me a few times. Some of his buyers recognized that all his artwork was done by the same artist. But I was the only one who recognized that some of the paintings were recent. That impressed him. Eventually, he told me his secret. So then you two fell in love, and then he turned you into his Tyro. Oh, no. I married another man. These things happen, Mark. I moved on because the company I was working for transferred me to New York. There I met my husband. Sure, Belmonte was disappointed. However, we kept our friendship by writing from time to time. My love was a humble man, a good man. Eventually, he passed away. Belmonte visited me to see how I was doing. I was living my life, but not really living. The president pitied me and begged me to join the society as an official vampire. And what about today? Are you two together? We are not dating. We just are really great friends. Charlie started to fidget. Is there fresh blood? I'm really thirsty. Certainly. Help yourself. My donors wouldn't stay for our company, but they left some of their blood in the fridge. You'll find it in the water bottles. There's also livestock out back if you'd rather drink bull's blood. Life with vampires really was different. Um, let me help you bring some bottles out for the others. Let me help you bring some bottles out for the others. Sure. Is everything ready for tomorrow? Of course. We have enough drinks to supply a hospital. <laughs> They'll be defrosted by morning. A wicked gleam crossed Charlie's face. He rubbed his fingers. Belmonte smiled back. Great. I can't wait to play. The Society of the Arts needs to show off its musical genius. It'll be a reunion the Americans won't forget anytime soon. It's about time we introduce a new vampire. We'll stun every vampire organization, commune, and family. They'll be talking about this gathering for years to come. Some things on stream. So many dumb things.